and therefore the, the the Lynette Zhang game plan I think is something that everyone needs to be cognizant of. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full-service physical gold and silver company. And on this very, very <laughs> special edition of Coffee with Lynette, I have my very good friend, George Gammon. And we are sitting out Gorgeous, by my it? pond, mm -hmm. right, which is all about water and food. And I'm so happy to have you back again, George. Oh, it's fantastic to be here. It's a gorgeous day. I wish the people oh. could see there's not a cloud in the sky and uh, the running water. It's it's really nice to be here. Uh, you know, we have to have some pretty because all the time we're looking at an awful lot of ugly. Yeah, yeah. Economically, for sure. Economically, yeah. without a doubt. So let's just start because you just did I mean your videos lately if you guys have not gone to a site which would be surprising to me but if you haven't you have to all of the links are available below as well as on our blog and you just did an excellent video that everybody should be watching on volatility and the fiat currency system and you used a great an analogy on how volatility remains in the system even when the, when it's capped. Yeah. Can you talk yeah. to that a little bit more? Because people think that, oh, the Fed did this, and so that made things safer, but... Yeah. Well, I can't take too much credit for that idea, because that's from Chris Cole. Right. And so I want to give him all the... And all, he deserves you know, it. Him for sure. But he has an idea where volatility can't be extinguished or it can't be reduced. So if you reduce the amount of volatility in one area, it's going to show up even more in somewhere else. So mm -hmm. the um, example he was giving is since 2008, well, maybe even 2000, we've tried to reduce the amount of volatility in the stock market by mm -hmm. doing quantitative easing or, you know, the Fed and their... Uh, the psychological games that they try to play, you know, with the expectations, policies, and whatnot. And they, they do this to try to smooth out the business cycle, or at least in assets, you know, to smooth out this boom-bust type, type of thing, to where assets only go up and up and up. But in doing so, you're creating volatility somewhere else that should have been initially expressed through the stock market. So where is it showing up? Social unrest. Right. Because you're you're increasing the wealth gap, because the people who own the assets are the ones that are benefiting, but the people who don't own assets, they're left high and dry, because and it makes it harder and harder and harder for them to buy a house or to buy stocks. And if they do, they have to buy them at ever increasing prices, and those last people coming in are more at risk if nominal prices go down. Right. So that that was his example, and I thought you you, you think about that. And it, and it really makes sense. And it goes back to something that I believe and that there's no free lunch. And I believe so, that so too. whatever you do or whatever the government does is an example of the stimulus check. You can say, well, it saved a bunch of people. You know, we had to do it. Well, that may be true. It may be true. But you're only looking at the benefit. There is always going to be a cost. So to do a proper analysis, you have to ask yourself, what, what is the cost? And I would argue that it would be distorting the economy even further by misallocating resources. Right. And we've got our entire economy that's been built on artificially low interest rates. And most people don't realize that interest rates are the cost of money. Exactly. Right. And money is one half of every single transaction. Mm -hmm. So if you're fixing the price of money, in essence, you're fixing the price of every single transaction in the economy. And that's not good. That's going to be a misallocation of scarce resources with alternative uses. And at some point in time, that's going to collapse in on itself. That was the whole problem, or one of the main problems, with communist Russia, mm -hmm. is they didn't have any price signals. Okay, well, you don't have price What does that mean? Well, that misallocates resources. So you start... Uh, you have famine over here when you've got the Ukraine, which is uh, could have provided food for a hundred Russias, 
that that's a result of the price signals, a result of the misallocation. And the, the more we fiddle around with the free market, the more we're doing the exact same thing, but just in a different, more roundabout way. Well, we saw a really similar kind of thing back in March and April where you had farmers destroying their crops, yeah, yeah, exactly. right? The exact same thing. And the, the other piece of it that I really wanted to talk to you about today is the leverage that's allowed inside of the system because of those low interest rates and the cost of debt being so cheap. Yeah. Right? So if you can borrow for nothing, right, and then you're basically guaranteed that whenever there's a correction in the market, the Fed's going to rush in with more to support this, well, you know, can't they do this forever? And this is leading to a question on derivatives. But, you know, can't they do this forever? Because that's what a lot of people think. They can just do this forever. Well, it didn't work in Japan. No, it didn't, did it? So we're about maybe seven years behind uh, Japan in, in our policies. And so it, it's not to say that the United States has to be Japan, because a lot of people that like to focus on the deflation argument They'll say, well, you know, Japan did QE, Japan did this, Japan did that, and they've still had uh, deflation in their economy. But their market, in nominal terms, is lower today than it was in 1990, where our market did the opposite. So just because we do exactly what Japan does doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to get the exact same results. But my point there is, you know, they've bought the junk debt. They've bought the, they've had negative interest rates. They've had ZERP and NERP Yield and curve all these control things. and, <laughs> exactly. right. And they still went, uh, there's, yeah, their yield curve still inverted. Yeah, and they couldn't Even, control those asset prices. They, right. they still went down. So it's, it's, it's not a, a guaranteed type of thing. You know, with quantitative easing, the more I talk to guys like Jeff Snyder and my, my good friend uh, Brent Johnson, the more you start to realize that the, the way they do quantitative easing, it, it doesn't have a direct effect on the market. It, it may have an indirect effect, but what the Fed's game is is more psychological. Exactly. They'll try to jawbone the market higher because they realize just by creating more bank reserves, it, it doesn't really, unless there's a third party action, it's not going to get the, the, the intended result, right? So as an example, the Fed comes in, they buy treasuries, they buy more right. direct securities. That increases the amount of bank reserves, but it, they're still reliant upon the banks to use that excess balance sheet capacity to extend loans to the hedge funds, and then they're, requ they're relying on the hedge funds to then right. believe that there's a Fed put to go in and buy stocks, and then they're reliant on all the the financial advisors to continue to push this 60-40 portfolio and they're reliant on the general public to still want to go in and buy equities because they believe there's a Fed put. So it's not just this you know, light switch where you create more bank reserves and boom, all of a sudden the stock market goes up as a result of those additional bank reserves. There's, got to, there's multiple things that have to happen. So that's why... Um, the more I look at it, the more you realize that the Fed's in a in, in really in a game of psychology. You know, Jeff yes. Snyder said this really well the other day. I don't know if it was on, I retweeted it. I don't know if I saw it on Twitter or maybe on one of his interviews. But he said the Fed isn't really a part of the monetary system so much as they're a part of the financial media. Hmm. And I th if, that's if kind you, of if you really interesting, let that isn't it? Sink in, yeah, you're like, okay, yeah, that that starts to make a lot of sense. It does make a lot of sense, and also the Fed now accounts where they can make that direct deposit to the individuals and not completely bypassing the bank because the bank has the relationship with the individuals, right? The sticky relationship. That's what the Fed still needs the banks to do. Yeah, but in the future, and you've talked about this just as much as I had or I have where we all have an account with the Fed. So the, the was the Banking for All Act. Exactly. Or now we go to a Fed coin or a central bank digital currency. Or which digital is, dollars. So we keep the name the same. Yeah. So people don't realize that anything has changed. But Yeah, well, they'll all, they'll all have to download the app on their phone. And that will instantaneously create this a, a, a bank account at the Fed. So just like the primary dealer banks have accounts with the Fed, 
or just like you have an account with B of A or Wells Fargo, whatever, your account, or you'll now have an additional account at the Federal Reserve where they can directly just go to the old computer and just like they type in an additional, uh, mm-hmm. you know, numeric amount to someone's bank reserve account, they'll do the same thing with yours, and that goes straight to your phone. So now all of a sudden, they're turning bank reserves into legal tender. And when they do that, and as Dr. Lacey Hunt says, when the Fed starts paying the bills, that's when you really need to start worrying about uh, consumer price inflation because they're yeah. completely circumnavigating the entire banking system. And that whole daisy chain that we were talking about earlier, that goes away and it does become a direct relationship between the Fed, the consumer, then all you have to do is worry about the consumer spending it, if you're them. And then you just right. put a, a time frame on it. So here's your stimulus, exactly. here's your 5000 in stimulus, but you got to spend it in the next 30 days. And this is a, a discussion I had with Raul Paul uh, this morning from Real Vision. And the reason I say that mm-hmm. is because it's not just you and I talking about it. I mean, the all the top people in macro are really you know, thinking through this uh, central bank digital currency, which, by the way, you and I were talking about a long, long time oh, ago. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We've been talking about it and the reset. I started talking right. about the reset 2008, oh, and 2009. Oh, I need to give you credit for that. Yeah, because I, I took that baton from you and ran with it. And I'm so you glad you did. Because you turned me on to it. I'm like, holy cow, okay. I didn't even know this was going well, on. Let me, give you another, let me give you another piece in here because I've been doing uh, a little bit, you know, the Fed came out with its financial stability report. And of course, you know, I've been doing pieces on that so I could dig in deeper. But part of, and when we're going back to talk about the the uh, volatility and reducing the volatility, yeah. what is really more volatile than, oh, let's say derivative bets, yeah, right? right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So in a, in a piece by the ISDA, right now, now derivatives are just a big bet and it's based on the price action of the underlying. And it can so be a bet on a bet on a bet. Exactly. I mean, it's insanity. But what I find really interesting is we all know that in 2008 is when liquidity dried up in that system and we had the financial crisis. Yeah, yeah. So rather than changing behavior, they simply came up, which is what they always do, with a change in the accounting laws and they created what they call netting and compression. And, you know, I just did calculations, um, actually yesterday I was working on this, and the example that the ISDA, which is that self-regulatory body that creates the derivative market, monitors it, and can even determine whether or not a default is actually a default. Right. I mean, it's craziness. But in their documentation, they use the example of how to how to compress 400 and I believe it was oops I don't need them 438 uh, trillion dollars notional of derivatives into 10. Now I'm kind of thinking that if they use that as an example, that's probably a fairly common compression because it looks really bad. I mean, if you actually look at it, because those derivatives did not go away. Those $428 trillion in notional, it's just accounting tricks, right? And I think that that too is about controlling the volatility, but- uh, And also LIBOR could be too. Exactly. I don't know if you saw that video I did, but uh, uh, you know, the, the, the move from LIBOR to SOFR, Right. Could potentially be a, a way to suppress volatility by taking out that, that LIBOR rate from the, the, I don't know if I want to, this, the, from, from the um, Stated? financial, you now see the, the financial media and a lot of managers use that LIBOR rate. Uh, I forgot the exact chart that they use, but I'll have to give it to you later. But they use that LIBOR rate to determine the health of the system. And uh, and so if you take out that rate and replace it with SOFR, which is really just a, a rate that's done on the repo transactions, right? Then you eliminate kind of like a, a window or a, 
uh, yeah, this glimpse that we had into the financial health of the system. Okay, so I, I would kind of argue that a little bit because that was a stated rate based upon what the banks, the if they spread, were going the to. Spread. Editor, right. throw that in there. Yep, <laughs> definitely. But the other part of that is they have been unsuccessful in creating those new markets. Mm. And what I find, and I've been talking about this since mid-October, when they ran that test on $80 trillion in derivative contracts, converting it or re-auctioning it into SOFR, and then it was dead silence, and now they've come out and said, well, yeah, some of these LIBOR rates are going to go away by the end of 2021, like we already said, but these U.S. dollar LIBOR rates, wow, we're going to do that until 2023. So I'm not convinced, you know, I think they're afraid of that volatility. I don't think that that's going to go off without a hitch. Do you? Well, I I don't know that they're going to go to SOFR. I, I mean, I don't I, either. I've talked to Snyder about it, and Snyder says it's impossible because you, you just if that's why they're continuing to use LIBOR because that's the only thing that's realistic for them to use. And he gave up, uh, or he talked about a few things that would prevent them from doing so. Um, and you know, he's the expert on that. I'm not, but he said it, it's probably not going to happen. And I, when I'm it gets agreeing. closer to 2021 or that deadline they have, he's like they'll probably just have to back down and say, okay, LIBOR wins. Uh, well, that, that's pretty much what they just did by coming out after they ran this test. I mean, they they probably did figure it out. And even when uh, when uh, Jerome Powell came out with the Main Street Lending Program, which would have been a perfect time to force the, the sofa down everybody's throat, he immediately backed off. Yeah. So I, and used LIBOR. And so I, I'm in agreement. I don't see, and I've been saying this from the beginning, there, I don't see how they can possibly do it because the other part of it is how it, uh, how it changes the price on the books of all those contracts. Yeah. yeah you, you know, another thing, too, that's coming to mind, because uh, that video I did on it was, was quite some time ago, but I, if uh, SOFA is tied to repo, and we have a repo spike like we did in September last year, the repo spikes 10%, but if you notice, LIBOR didn't. Right. Because LIBOR isn't a rate, as you know, that, it's, that's, it's just a phone call. Hey, what do you think? Exactly. Oh, uh, 2%. Okay, stated. great. Yep. It's not on actual transactions. Yep. So that could be a bad thing, but in that case, it could be a good thing because you're still issuing new debt on LIBOR that's not spiking with repo. But if everything is spiking with repo at the exact same time and you lose control of repo, then that means that everything that's tied to those euro dollar rates or the, the LIBOR rate. Uh, spikes as well. So that means that if, if repo spikes, mortgages, credit card, really every single um, interest rate in the economy, in the global economy, would spike. And what does that do when sovereign debt is at all-time high, consumer debt, corporate debt, everything at all-time high? That's that's where you're in the no bueno zone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's a really good way. No bueno zone. Yeah, I think so. But you know, if you, if you, if, you know, just kind of going back to that, from that transition from that 438 to 10, that would put, if that's common, that that would put the actual notional value of the derivative market somewhere, I think it came out to something like 12 point something quadrillion. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah Okay, yeah. so the last time that I had checked before they changed the accounting for the biz, before I knew how to capture print screen, Sorry, I, I wish I knew at that point, but I didn't. Um, it was 1.48 quadrillion. That's what I saw on the on the Bank for International uh, Settlements yes, um. site on global derivatives, and that had to be probably in 2008, 2009, 2000, yeah. somewhere in there. And so now, I mean, how do you bail that out? How do you bail that in? I mean, this is why we have to have a reset, but. Do you think that all of the suppression is pushing that volatility into that really hidden danger? Well, I agree with Chris that, that uh, it's got to come out somewhere. I it mean, has there's no to. free lunch. You, at some point, you're going to have to pay the fiddler. Now, it, you could argue that it's better for it to come out over here than over here, but it's still going to be a cost benefit analysis. Like Thomas Sowell says, who's my favorite economist, there are no solutions, there are only trade offs. 
Yeah. So you you've got to look at those trade offs. But you know, you, you bring up derivatives, and what what bothers me right now about what I see, not everyone, but a few people, a few of the gold people on Twitter and a few of the Bitcoin people and the crypto, is they, they ask me my opinion on, well, all these new products that they have where they take physical gold and they do this to it and put it on Ethereum and then wrap it with the blockchain, you know, whatever they do. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute, guys, you're turning gold into a derivative. You're turning Bitcoin into a derivative. And isn't the whole point that we want to reduce the amount of financialization that we have in our economy. That's the problem. That's what the problem is. We don't have a real economy anymore. We have a financial economy. And we don't want that. We want to reduce the size of the financial economy and go back to creating wealth the way wealth is actually created through the production of goods and services. Not just by, you know, trying to get rich by creating a gold derivative that makes it easier to buy, sell, or lend against, or something like that. And I don't know. It not, and I'm not saying that those aren't good ideas. I just, whenever I hear about that, I, I kind of, I'm like, what are we doing here? Aren't we just, aren't we just well, going from the frying pan into the fire? <laughs> exactly. And you know, and and beyond that, when you're looking at this global fiat economy. There are the haves and the have-nots, and that just increases that income inequality. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, so it, it's like this big, huge yeah. circle. And the incentives that you were talking about before. Remember, you talked about the incentives by the Fed taking interest rates down to zero, and, and so we don't have a market rate anymore. And then that and creates fundamentals all these don't loans. matter. Fundamentals don't loan. The hurdle rate goes right. down. And then you also have people going further and further out the risk curve and taking on all of this excessive, uh, well, excessive risk because they can't get yield anywhere else and that's distorting the economy further. And then it it creates this feedback loop where the economy has to become more and more financialized because you need ever-increasing asset prices, you need more and more debt, and the underpinning is is confidence. And once that confidence goes, then poof, it's gone. And people, you know, I don't think they really contemplate it often, but they have to realize that the, the dollar or any fiat currency, and to a certain extent, maybe even Bitcoin and gold, it, it's 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 really all about confidence. It's about, uh, Chris yeah. Cole calls it a thought abstraction, and I would argue that, that gold you know, has a lot of intrinsic value, and I think that Bitcoin, the, the way it's used, has value because of the of, of cross-border payments and whatnot, and maybe a potential store of value. But with fiat currency, it has no value whatsoever, whatsoever other than the confidence that someone else is going to give you a, a good in service for this green or purple or whatever piece of paper. And uh, once you start realizing that and then understanding that the derivatives are built on top of a thought abstraction, you realize how, how fragile the system is and how, again, I would prefer if we were moving back towards... A, an, an economy where it, it's all about producing goods and services. Right, uh, and bringing uh, value. More, and bringing value. Right. Because at the end of the day, that's wealth. You know, I always use uh, the example, well, it, it shifts example, but, you know, of someone being on a, a desert island, and okay, great, you got your chest of gold, you've got your billion dollars, you've got your billion bitcoins, but you've got two coconuts and some salt water. And so are you rich or are you poor? You're poor. So it, it, it's just to remind people that the true wealth in the economy is the goods and services. And, you know, when we distort the economy with these low interest rates, it makes all these corporations go back out there. And instead of creating more jobs, creating more goods and services, what do they do? They just buy back their own shares. And that's the easier way to get rich when you got a risk-reward where the Fed has this put, whether it's explicit, implicit, whatever it is, and then you have more and more of the economy moving into the financial sector and away from producing goods and services. So now we've got a complete detachment. Like there is oh no God, relationship yes. whatsoever between the real economy and the stock market. And I would all, almost argue that there's an inverse relationship to the point where, you know, any news is good news. Right. If, if, yeah, it doesn't if, matter what unemployment it is, number right? the other day. You're right. You know, it just it just any news is good it's news good because, because either now it's good, it's good, print good more. or right. yeah, or it's bad. They're going to go ahead and print more. But at some point in time, 
and I think we've discussed this, we, we kind of, in my opinion, we went from a, a Fed put, and whether it's psychological or not, we'll just, it was there. Right. So we've gone from a Fed put to a government put. And I think exactly. we did this back in March mm -hmm. when uh, the Fed had that meeting on Wednesday scheduled, but then they had the emergency meeting the Sunday prior where they dropped uh, interest rates down to zero. They did QE infinity, they admitted right. to it, and all of these actions in the repo market, and a lot of their four and five letter programs, the market opened the next day and was still down by like a thousand points. Right. It was almost like limit down, I think the futures were that Sunday night, where uh, the market kept tanking and just kind of shrugged off this, foot, this Fed put, like, hey, we're, we're not playing that game anymore. But what happened the Wednesday is the government came in and announced the stimulus package, then the market starts going back up to now we're at all time highs. So that's why I say I think we've gone to a government put. But we've seen in other countries where that government put can also expire. Right. I think that's the catalyst that people have to look for. Once the government put expires, meaning they come out with XYZ stimulus and people don't and trust the market it. still goes right. down, that's when we have the opposite where any news is not good news. Now, any news is bad news. And the same uh, you know, feedback loop that took us up and up and up takes us down okay. and down and down. Well, do you think that's what Janet Yellen coming in as Treasury Secretary? I think it's all about MMT. That's, I, I would so agree with mo that. Most people that don't haven't really studied MMT, the, the very first thing you do is you merge the two balance sheets. Mm -hmm. So you take the balance sheet of the Fed, you take the balance sheet of the Treasury, boom, you got one. And that's where... The, there's you don't have to go through well maybe you do but you know it makes it a lot easier to just spend money and you're not worried you can just monetize however much you want and you're, you're not worrying about it so I think if, if I wanted to merge those two balance sheets you know who would you hire as Treasury Secretary oh, but someone who was just yeah or a dove <laughs> right who was just in charge of the Fed because she obviously has an uh, intimate understanding of both balance sheets extremely well I said the next thing they're gonna do is they're gonna hire Kelton as Fed chair and boom, now you're off to the races. Now you're off to the races, <laughs> exactly. I mean, I, I hope you guys are ready for this because, yeah. you know, when we're talking about scarce resources, yeah. you know, what do you think? Where, I mean, we were kind of talking about the trucks before we went on air, okay? So if we're looking at an unlimited money supply, an unlimited debt supply, and a loss of confidence... Well, what do you think? What are you doing for yourself? Well, I think you, for, for the average person, you have to own gold. You have to own precious metals. Uh, I see silver as more of a speculation. Gold more as insurance. I think on the speculative side of things, Bitcoin is a good speculation. And uh, for the, the average person, just make sure that if you've got a mortgage, it's 30-year fixed rate. Exactly. Just make sure. And you have the gold that. Yeah. on the other yeah. side. Yeah, and then I like to have the bulk of my portfolio on things that pay me to own them. So that's mm -hmm. how I would define an investment. And the reason being is because I'm not that good, and I know that I'm never going to be a pro. I'm always going to be an amateur investor. And um, You're pretty good, George. Well, <laughs> I'll I, tell you, I think you're pretty good. I appreciate it, but the, the reason I like to own things that pay you to own them mm -hmm. is because you're making money from day one. Exactly. And if the investment doesn't make sense the day you buy it, just don't buy it. And like if you're buying a McDonald's, and I think it comes from my background as an entrepreneur. Because when I would go in and, and look at potentially buying a McDonald's, as mm -hmm. an example, I would never go in with the intent to sell in six months or sell in right. a year. Or, right. You know, I go in there looking at the P&L, profit mm -hmm. and loss. Mm -hmm. And if this McDonald's is making 100 grand a year, I say, okay, great. You know, how can I maybe improve it? How much debt would I have to take on to buy the, 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 the McDonald's? And then does it make sense? Because I want to own it for the rest of my life because I'm buying that stream of cash flow exactly. that hopefully I can improve. And let's say you own this McDonald's for four or five years and you're able to hire good management. So they take the, the, the cash flow from 100000 a year up to 200000 a year. But your broker, your business broker, comes to you and says, George, I've got terrible news. Interest rates have gone up. Therefore, the million dollars that you paid for the McDonald's now, you could probably only get nine fifty for it. Who cares? Who cares? I don't exactly. I, I could care less because I'm not selling. And my manager has done a great job increasing the amount of money that goes into my back pocket 
from 100 grand to 200 grand. It's a fantastic investment. So that that's why I like to have the bulk of my portfolio in that thing because you don't. My my point there is you don't care if the price goes up. You Correct. don't care if the price goes down. Just so long as that revenue stream is is consistent, and that's what you know, doing all the homework and buying things cheap. That's when that comes into play up front. Well, you know, just kind of taking us full circle then too. When we look at the asset inflation that these zero ZERP interest rates have been giving us, I mean, you know, it's hard for me when I'm looking out there to see what is cheap, yeah. where I can oh, generate you, you that income. In fact, in fact, my sister, I, I told her I was coming over today, and she's a huge fan of yours, by oh, the way. Oh, thank you. Well, and tell her I said hello. <laughs> she says, ask Lizette, or uh, ask Lynette about uh, gold miners. She wants your opinion on gold miners right now because they've kind of pulled back a little bit. And uh, she's like, ask her if it's a good time to buy. Um, I am waiting on any stocks until we get this route myself. Because buying Even a gold, gold miner, okay. yeah, that that's not, you know, I, look, anybody, everybody's got to do what they're comfortable doing, mm -hmm. regardless of what anybody says. So I always have to say that. For me, I'm a strategist. And like you, I want to own undervalued assets. Yeah. That, I don't know, yes, definitely do generate income, but could also be in a long-term positive trend. Mm. So when I'm looking at gold miners, it, it's not the underlying gold. You have the debt, you have the speculation. Management. And management, exactly. So I personally feel a lot more comfortable with the physical in my possession. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right, lease. You heard it. There straight, you go. Elise. Straight, no, lease. Lease. Yeah. And Lise, if you're in Straight Phoenix, <laughs> you can come and join us here at the farm. But, you know, the so for me personally, when I'm looking at how I'm currently positioned, because those opportunities I don't really see very much, right? Okay. right? Um, that's what the gold is for me, opportunity. I mean, it, th there are many layers to it. Right. But part of my strategy is an opportunity positioning. Mm -hmm to take advantage of like what happened in Japan yeah. where we saw commercial real estate drop 95%. Mm -hmm. You know, and right now with the Fed propping everything up, there's no good price discovery. There hasn't been for, right. you know, really probably earlier than 2008. But, you, you know, know. You know, people always ask me about deflation in gold as well. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, listen, I'm, I'm not an expert, but in my mind, I mean, you've got to ask yourself, what's deflating? Right? Let's say gold goes down by, I don't know, uh, 20% if we have quote-unquote deflation. But what if, if that's the world we live in, what happens to asset prices? In right. that world, asset prices are going to go down by 50 75%, in which case your gold would increase in purchasing power relative to those assets. That's true, but actually when you look back in history at deflationary periods and the performance of those other asset prices along with gold, mm. gold actually goes up in deflationary periods. Because in nominal it's a, terms? Yes, in okay. nominal terms, because it is really like a savings vehicle. Yeah, right. It's an insurance vehicle, it's a savings vehicle. Yeah. So, and in deflation, I mean, what happens when people are scared, they pull in, right? Mm. They don't want to spend they want to save. So actually history shows us that it, they actually perform, yeah. gold performs. Yeah. Because, and this is the other piece, and I, I did want to talk to you about it because I'm wrestling with this, you know, in my mind mm. between, say, gold and Bitcoin. And don't get upset with me, people. I've just, you know, I've got <laughs> George here. I'm going to talk to him about that. Yeah. Because it's easy for me to see the utility in gold. It's used across every single avenue of the global economy. Mm -hmm. So therefore you have the broadest base of buyer and you always have demand, even if it goes up and down, depending upon what's happening in the rest of the economy. Yeah. Um, you know, I listen to the commercials on, you know, well, that's why you don't need gold because we got rid of wampum, we got rid of gold, we got rid of, you know, we're getting rid of fiat and that's the whole point of, of, cryptocurrencies can you help me understand the utility there because i i, I don't i am having a 
hard time really seeing it. Well, there's so if uh, if you've got fifty million dollars in gold, it's going to be tough to transport that. If you got fifty million dollars in Bitcoin, it's just it's on a thumb drive, and you can you can uh, spend it. You know, it, theoretically, you can spend it just very easily. I could send. I can. I can not even wire. I can just give you X amount of dollars in Bitcoin just through just in seconds. You know, if you're all the way across the world. So from an efficiency standpoint, and okay. also too, it is um, there's accountability. So let's say that uh, we go back to the gold standard and uh, when we had the central bank. And I did a video on this the other day. I know. Where we went from full reserve to free banking. Yeah, it was a great video. To central banking. And so, the central, so all the gold is held by the central bank. And the, the, they're sitting there telling you they have the gold, but you're like, eh, do they? Do they? Well, right. if we're on a Bitcoin standard, we can tell that they've got the Bitcoin or they don't. So it's, it's all out there. So that would be a benefit. But, of course, it, like we said earlier, it's a cost-benefit analysis. There's pros and there's cons. And the pro with gold is that you got it's, history. It's real. It's real. And you can hold it in your hand. you got history on and, it. And it's full utility. Yeah, so I don't see them as competing assets. No. I, I never have, and I don't understand that argument. I, I just, I see gold as insurance, and I see Bitcoin is a, a very good speculation. But, uh, I, I mean, personally, I, if, you know, that 10% of my portfolio, gold, 10% of my portfolio is speculative, in which case all of it is not allocated to, to Bitcoin. I, I, I just... Um, well, I mean, to each his own. But I, I would right. never just take a hundred percent and just do one thing and sit there and claim that it's it's the be all end all. And uh, if you don't do this, you're quote unquote stupid. You know, another thing that I studied the other day, which I found fascinating, was uh, this hypothesis. I, I can't recall the author's name. I wish I could give him credit, but he had this hypothesis that in the West we've gradually moved away from religion and now you can argue that's good or bad whatever I'm not going to debate that right. but but that it but the bottom line is we have and human beings need some sort of meaning in their life yes so his theory was we in the, the Western society especially in the United States have filled that void with things like politics that that is now the new religion, oh. and that's why we've become so decisive, uh, and or divisive, excuse me. And the same thing with potentially gold and maybe Bitcoin. Maybe that's filled the void for some people. That it's 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 now their religion, or maybe now oh. Bitcoin is their religion. Because you get these people that are just, just they're, they're not invested in it. They're emotionally mm -hmm. invested in mm -hmm. it. And when you're emotionally invested into something, that's when I think you got to look in the mirror and kind of just do a reality check and say, wait a minute, this is not how prudent individuals allocate capital. And whether it's gold, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's stocks, whether it's real estate, you need to do things with as, as much of a absence of emotion as possible. But that's actually where the Wealth Shield strategy that, you know, I mean, I started the creation back in 1987 when I started studying currencies, and you can see currency life cycles. And, you know, I mean, I do like history because they really give you the pathway of the most likely next outcome, mm. right? Yeah. And the challenge that I have with a lot of the things that have come about since 2008 like, you know, netting and compression and the derivative markets to just make those look like they've gone away. Um, but also with the cryptocurrencies is they haven't been tested in a liquidity crisis. That's right. And I really do think that that's a lot of what happened in March and April and why they were the central banks globally were and continue to be so incredibly aggressive. Because I, I think, you know, it's hard to pinpoint the exact moment yeah. when everything is going to... Well, I, I can't remember who I was listening to the other day, but they uh, said one of the reasons that they may have come at the Fed, may have come in so aggressively is to bail out uh, 
I should say the name of the hedge fund, but uh, we'll, we'll call it the lo- one of the largest hedge funds in the world. Right. That is uh, would have potentially gone under if uh, they would have come out, come in and bailed out the, the treasury market. Because remember, the treasury market was no bid. Exactly. And if you're running a 60-40 risk parity portfolio that's levered up on treasuries, you got no bid, you got problems. <laughs> yeah, and you know, because we are so incestuously interconnected, Yeah, right. you know, I mean, really, it was pretty close to game over. And Well, so if those hedge funds go bust, then the pensions go bust then all the baby boomers go bust, and they're the only ones in the entire economy of savings, and then the savings vanishes just like that because all their savings is in the pension fund that's in the asset. I mean, it's just this it, daisy chain. It, it is, really. and that you know, and, but, but that's also, I guess, going back to that same discussion, I know my physical goal is outside, completely outside of the system. That's right. That's right. And it's and invisible. And no counterparty risk. And no counterparty risk. Whereas anything else is still inside, it's part of the system. Maybe it's not centralized, but it still goes over a grid. Yeah, right. And it still has to go through, uh, you know, a vendor to take it out. You can only take it out in in dollars. Although that may be changing. Wall Street's working a lot on really developing that market now. But I don't know. It's a challenge for me. Well, that's why I think you just got to look at them completely different and it's not uh do i buy this or do i buy this but you gotta buy both you, you, you gotta just get just get rational about it eliminate emotion and just look at the world around us and what's happening with the central banks and what's going to be happening in the future with more and more stimulus more and more central oh, planning and ask yourself you know how do i protect my 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 wealth how do i how do how I do, do this? How do you protect your standard of living? That's right. You know, food, water, energy, security, that barterability, wealth preservation, community, which mm-hmm. is what we're doing, and shelter. I mean, regardless of what's going on, that's really what we need. I agree. And it really brings us to, you know, you did that great video on uh, the reset mm-hmm. where I own nothing and I am happy. <laughs> that was the creepiest video. I, know. I have to I say, know. I want you to bring that up. I would love you to talk about that. And I do have that. I did gra- uh, grab that sound clip. Now is the historical moment, the time, not only to fight severe virus, but to shape the system for the need for the post-corona era. In short, we need a great reset. Can you talk about that? I own nothing, and, and I'm as happy as I could possibly be. Yeah, well, it's it's their vision for the future, and they... they and we're what, talking what, about the World Economic Forum, just uh, to yeah, be a little which, more which, clear the on IMF, this. IMF, the, the global right. elites, uh, you can throw them all in there. And what I found fascinating when I was doing the research for that is... When I when I Googled it initially, you know how the search results in Google tell you kind of like the the, the, the well, title, like the code mm-hmm. title or something like that? And sometimes you click on it and it, the, the, it's a different title? Yes. So I yes. noticed that the title of that was uh, something alarming, like, like I, I can't recall, like what the future or what 2020s or what 2030 is going to look like or something like that. And I clicked on the, the actual title and it was much more uh, mellow, let's say. I'm like... Hmm, that's odd. So I, I did some more searching, and I found that the original article was on Forbes with the original title, and that they changed the title and then put in this disclaimer. And I'm like, obviously, what happens? They got so much blowback oh, yeah. from that that they did all these things. But prior to that, they never had a disclaimer. Then, and the disclaimer said, "Oh, this isn't our vision of the future. We're just using this as a thought experiment." Like, right. okay, well, why didn't you have that in the original? blog post right and also if you read not just that one but multiple posts multiple. And on on their site and the IMF you start putting all these pieces of the puzzle together but basically they they're central planners Lynette, they're and central they are. planners and so they their ideal is for the, you know communist russia let's say from the standpoint of they own the housing the government owns the housing they, and it, they even talked about not even owning your own clothes. And then having the the cloud, which 
all of the information, whether it's the transactions that you're doing on a daily basis, your thoughts, even your dreams being collected, and I'm assuming they collect them by some sort of microchip. And if you think I'm, I'm, I've got the tinfoil hat on here, I, I, right. I, I totally can see where you're coming from, but just go to their website <laughs> and read it yourself. It's, it's right it, there. It, it really is. So everything's going into the cloud, and then I think their, their game plan, and they haven't stated this explicitly, but you can kind of connect the dots, is to have all of this information go to the cloud, there's a tremendous amount of data in real time, and then have artificial intelligence kind of crunch all of the data and then be able to allocate those scarce resources so to, to a point where they won't need prices. You see, if, if you and I were in charge, if, they, if the World Economic Forum came to us, let's say, and, and said, Lynette, George, you guys are the experts. We need you to come up with a game plan on how we could make communism work, right? I, obviously, you and I would tell them to pound sand, right. but l let's just say <laughs> right. that, that, that we are okay. going to kind of whiteboard that out mm -hmm. just, for, just for, you know, a thought experiment or whatever. That's what I do. That's exactly what I do. So you look back at what happened in Russia and why it, it, it went south. You know, that's that price curve we talked about. And so I would say, okay, Lynette, what we need is we need everyone to have an account with the Fed or the central bank because we need all of those transactions. We need to understand where people are spending their money, what they're spending it on. We need to understand that in real time. So the billions right. of transactions that happen in the United States daily, we need that coming in to the cloud in real time. Then we need to hopefully get people's, you know, their, their thoughts. And then, you know, for healthcare, we need to get the chip to send the, us their heart rate and everything so we can determine if we have to provide healthcare, who gets the healthcare and who doesn't, right? And not only that, but we can determine by the chip if you've been eating too much sugar. And if you've been eating too much sugar for the greater good we're going to cut you off from buying sugar for the next six months because you're part of the healthcare system. And for the greater good of society, we're, we're, we're not going to allow you to eat those wow. donuts anymore. You see? And then I would take, and I'd say, by 2030, artificial intelligence will be so powerful that if we collect all this data in real time, artificial intelligence will be able to allocate resources and manage the economy better than individual human beings could back in the day of free market capitalism. And obviously th those aren't my words. <laughs> right, I, I, no. I think this would be a disaster, but I, if you're just asking me how I would make it happen with the, the greatest chance of, or the, the least probability of, of, of economic collapse from communism, that, that's kind of how I'd wave the magic wand. So I would assume that their goal, well, I know their goal is central planning. They right. are explicit in that. Uh, so, you know, how do you get from A to B? Exactly. And everything that they're doing now with the central bank digital currencies, it all plays right into that. And again, I, I don't want to say that um, th I'm definitively certain this is their game plan. I, I'm really trying right. this to. This is just, just what they're putting. They are they're putting actually out putting and out me just there. Just trying to connect right. the dots uh, the best way that I can. Yeah. So, how would in this scenario? How would the government end up owning everything? Well, that I don't think that happens overnight. So I think right. first you have a collapse in asset prices. So the, the Fed, or if they've merged the two balance sheets, MMT, right. Right, then it could be the government coming in and giving everyone a bailout at 100 cents on the dollar. So you got Ford bankrupt, Tesla bankrupt, you've got AT&T bankrupt because they're levered to the hilt. You've got all these corporations that are completely insolvent and they say, listen, we need a bailout. That's okay. We'll just we'll, we'll buy, you know, fifty-one percent of the shares or something like that. And you've got all the people in the GFC that that uh, you know they are on the verge of losing their house. Great financial re uh, uh, crisis. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The, the, the Two thousand eight, the global financial crisis. And so you know you lose fifty percent of your equity, and now you're upside down. You don't know what you're going to do. You, you you have to file bankruptcy. And then the government of the Fed comes in and says, listen, we'll buy your house at 100 cents in the dollar, and then you can go ahead and just rent it from us. And then you've got a group of people that wouldn't be forced to sell, so they would still have private ownership. But there's always a 100 cent bid from the government on their house, 
or another thing I think that might happen is they increase taxes mm -hmm. so much on the capital gains that they say, okay, if you sell it to a private party, you're taxed at 90% at capital gains. But if you sell it to the government, then we'll go ahead and lower that down to zero because if the government owns the asset, then we know it's, it's, it's for the greater good. And we're, we're gonna, we're, if, if the government owns everything, then we never have to ever again worry about this boom bust cycle crushing the economy. And we can move on in, into a, 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 a utopian society where uh, you don't have to worry about assets. You don't need them anymore. We don't need the financialized economy because it's all in the government's balance sheet. Boy, you know, we're really, when you think about that, then what would be, you know, you made a statement earlier about human beings needing that purpose in life, needing something, you know, to oh, hold yeah. on to. Oh, yeah. So what does that look like? Because uh, I agree I mean, with you. I mean, we all need a purpose. Honestly, I think it would be drugs. I mean, I hate to say that, but, but you, because another thing that they want to completely eliminate religion. And uh, again, I'm not here to argue whether that's good or bad, but I, I think, why do you eliminate religion? Because right. then the government becomes God. And then think about it. The government's oh. providing you with everything. The government is providing you with shelter. The government's providing you with food, with clothing, with a job. The government's providing you with health care. See, so they're in the position, and it takes you straight back to 1984, Orwell, all that stuff. So, again, I, I don't know definitively that that's their game plan. But uh, it, it seems to make sense. It, it makes a lot of sense. And it is not a future that looks pretty for my children, my family, and people that I love. And all everybody out there. Well, the good news is that there are no certainties. There are only right. probabilities. And, and, and a lot of people think this, uh, this agenda, which they, they call it an agenda. That's not my word. Right. Uh, this great reset agenda is just there, it's going to be one foul swoop and the whole entire globe is going to be under their control. Not necessarily because there are a lot of countries that would not benefit from this right. in any way, shape, or form. Because right. one of their big pushes is with green energy. And so you've got to look at uh, the Middle East as an example, mm -hmm. like Saudi Arabia. They're not going to play ball with that. And if you look at a lot of their, uh, their, their initiatives for greater equality, right? They, and to be clear, they... In, in, they say that they're not looking for equality of opportunity. They're looking for equality of outcomes. That's the key. Quality of, of, of outcome. Oh. Right? So that, that's, that gets very, very scary. That does but, get scary. But there's a lot of places around the globe that I think will most likely tell them to pound, pound sand because it would just, their initiative or their agenda would just utterly destroy their entire economy. So I don't think it's something that they can just roll out. It's not. Uh, yeah, I don't the think the entire it, globe. So there's going to be yeah. areas where, you know, it might be uncomfortable. Uh, you might have to move, or you might have to move some capital. But there's going to be capital flight to areas that I don't think are going to be on board with this. And and probably also out to you know more rural areas. Yeah. Out of the cities? Yeah, see, my concern with that is, well, with your plan, you're good to go because you're self-sufficient. And then that's the piece. See, I mean, see, I think we all need to be as self-sufficient yeah. as possible. Yeah, I go back to the desert island example, and I'm like, or I, you know, I have so many employees in Medellin from Venezuela, and they oh. fled Venezuela because of the hyperinflation and, right. and socialism there. And I, so I, I always kind of remind myself, listen, if I had... Uh, a billion dollars worth of gold but I was in Venezuela and I couldn't get out that's I'm still right. screwed I'm right. still dirt poor I still can't I can't put food on the table you know now if I could get out I've preserved my wealth through gold which is great but being right there I'm, I'm I, I got big problems because there is no food at any price <laughs> you know so it's it, again, it goes back to goods and services, and that's why I say, with, especially with Americans, I mean, for heaven's sake, get a passport. Right. You know, I mean, why not? What's your downside there? And if you well, got we one, might have to get vaccine in order to get on the plane. Yeah. Well, that's a whole other oh, topic. Oh, that is another topic. Why not we'll save one. that for another but, day. But, but, but my point there is, even if you've got your gold, even if you've got your Bitcoin or, or, or whatever is, is the store of value for you, maybe diesel trucks or artwork or right. whatever it is. Right. If you're in the United States. 
and, and you're thinking of, well, this is going to protect me and I don't need to worry about it. Eh, if we don't have the supply chain, everything. if we don't have the goods and you services... You need to be as independent. It, yeah, yeah. You, there are no goods and services for that Monet to, to, to buy for you. And therefore, the, the, the Lynette Zhang game plan, I think, is something that everyone needs to be cognizant of. And if they can't execute to the degree that you do, maybe they could just have... You know, well, some sort of plan B there. I always talk about just having an RV for heaven's sakes, and maybe having a, a cabin up in the mountains that where you can grow some of your own food. Right. And so where if it hits the fan, then you can just hop in your little airstream with your diesel truck, and then go up to the mountains and just at least have something, something. there. That I think. Oops. Oops. Oh. Okay. <laughs> well, we've got sun now. Yeah. And th that kind of leads me to the last question which is I'd like you to talk more about the rebel capitalist movement. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I think the rebel capitalist movement is something where I'm trying to, I'm trying to champion free market capitalism. And it's not just capitalism, because capitalism without a free market it is, it well, that's is, what we kind of have now, isn't it? Yeah, you just Crony get close, capitalism. Yeah, you get close it's, to fascism. Right. So that's not good. We, we need the emphasis on the free market. And we need something to combat. With, uh, we need a narrative to combat the social planners, or excuse yeah. me, the central planners. Yeah. And I think if, if we can think about free market capitalism and us all standing up and rebelling against central planning. In, in a way that's non-violent. Non-violent, yes, non-violent. Yeah, but in, in, in where we take the high ground, not ethically and, and intellectually, and we come back with solid arguments that we know have, have stood the test of time, and and we continue to put out content like you're doing, uh, like and I'm like doing, you're doing, and right? everyone and is telling others, their friends right? and their families, and everyone becomes a kind of their own version of a rebel capitalist. And that's what I'd like to encourage everyone to do, be cognizant of, and continue to educate yourself and and just be prepared. Uh, because if you're not prepared, you're going to be a victim, like I always say. Exactly. And we talked about a lot of things today that really do not paint a particularly attractive picture to most people. Yeah. But unfortunately, there will be many that will be caught up in this trap because they believe the lies. Yeah. And I mean, and that that's been a, a a program since really Reagan formalized it yeah. in the early '80s. Perception management and financial repression, which you know, those aren't my words; those are the IMF yeah. words, and it's how they force you to take more risk. Yeah, I, I think that the, the people who are going to survive and thrive in this world of out of control central banks and big governments, like I always say or whatever's coming down the pipeline in the future are going to be the rebels. Yeah. And they're, they're going to be like you, you know? Yeah. And everything that you stand for. You're, you're outside of the Overton window, you know? People, they call us conspiracy theorists. They call us, you know, tinfoil hatters. They <laughs> call us, you know, fear mongers. Whatever you want to call us. The bottom line is, compared to the system, we are true rebels. And mm -hmm. I think those are the people that are going to do well in the future. And, um... That's why I'd encourage everyone to hop on board and join us and, and help us in the cause. Absolutely. And, and again, it's not just buying one thing. It's not, you know, gold alone. You can't eat gold, yeah. but you can convert it into food to eat. They did that in Zimbabwe, yeah, right. right, where they went out and they panned for gold. And that is actually how that they were able to support and feed their families. Yep. But it really is, food becomes the single biggest issue. It's food, it's water, it's energy, it's security, it's barterability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter. This is what we need to do to be as independent and self-sufficient as we are already walking through the reset. Yeah, right. You know, it, it's just not obvious to everybody because everybody thinks that's just going to be like this one big clap. But frankly, when we see that one big clap, whenever that is, yeah. it's too late to do anything about yeah, it. Yeah, you know, I think it's like that Hemingway quote about bankruptcy, where it happens very, very slowly. They try to boil the frog, and then it's just all at once. 
because yeah. they just chip away at it, chip away at it, chip away at it. Look at what's happening right now with the, what we'll call it the cerveza sickness, right? Yeah. Y you know, I like that term, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, but pr you know, prior to this, you'd have all the guys and the gals, and a lot of them were in the gold community, that would say, you know, the government will never cross this line because before they take my gold, I'll give them my lead. Right. You know, I, I've bullet. heard a lot of people right? say that. There's 300 million guns in the United States. Therefore, they can't do X, Y, Z. Or if, if they cross this line, then I'm going to go to the street with my gun. And they better not do this. They better not do this. And there's a lot of tough talk. And, and I totally get it. Like, I totally get it. Because, I, you know, I'm one of those people that's that's obviously, <laughs> you know, uh, rebels against uh, the central planners and the big government and whatnot. But my point is... We've not, in 2020, we've gone into this environment where they have literally locked us in our own home. Exactly. And they, gotten they, us they, to they, volunteer it. It, it, it. Not only that, but a lot of people are demanding it. Yes, it's a, true. A lot of people on, on a political side, you know, especially in California. Yeah. You know, they're, saying, oh, yeah. You know, they're, they're demanding tyranny be thrust upon them. Yep. You see? And so where are all the people that said that they were going to form a militia That's a really good and question. go out to the street with, with their guns and combat this. Because if you're not willing to do it now, where they're locking you in your own house, where they're telling you you cannot open your business, you cannot walk out on the beach, you cannot take your dog for a walk, and obviously it's to, to varying degrees around the, the country and different countries and whatnot, but you think that you're going to do that if they come in and want to confiscate your gold? No chance. So, so my point there is, if you if you you're not one of those people, or I I, I would never encourage violence, or I'd never uh, uh, suggest people use violence, but use a, a different tactic, and, and use that tactic of having a plan B to where if this comes, on, if if any type of central planning or lockdown or any type of 1984 nonsense comes comes. Uh, into the into the future, maybe it's 2022, but you've got that exit strategy yeah. to where you're not going to play ball and you're just going to unplug from the whole system, and you don't have to worry about your freedom being at at, at in, in jeopardy, really. And I, I really love the point that you made about you know people say, oh well, they would never cross the government would never cross this line, or central bankers would never cross that line, and there all those lines have really been obliterated obliterated in this pandemic You're right. right right but that is actually why i personally only buy the collectible gold because it is less likely should they do an over yeah. confiscation which i don't know maybe they will maybe they won't that's not within my control right but you know, when you're looking in the collectible arena, somebody that's paid $8 million for one ounce of gold is either writing the rules yeah. or likely to have the ability to influence those yeah. that write the, the yeah. rules. And, you know, they always say everything is voluntary. You know, taxes are voluntary. Okay, try not to volunteer. Yeah, right. Right? right. So they make it... Volunteer. Yeah, if you want to do anything, then you have to volunteer to take the vaccine or whatever they're going to come up with. Yeah. You know, I try and think, what if I'm right and what if I'm wrong? And if there's a solution or an answer that it doesn't matter whether or not I'm right or wrong, then that's the one that I'm most comfortable with. Yeah, as a prudent investor. Exactly. It, again, it goes, you're an investor. You're not emotionally invested. Exactly. It's the right tool for the job. Yeah, you got it. You got it. And, and you know what, too? One thing, I, I just in closing here, is if people are watching this video, you, you guys at home, and, and, and maybe thinking about what we're saying with this great reset, and you'll own nothing and you'll be happy, and you, you're thinking to yourself, that will never happen in the United States. It will never happen here. No chance. You know, Lynette and George are just fear-mongering. I'd really encourage you to think back to 2019, and if you and I were sitting here one year ago talking about how there could potentially be the Cerveza sickness and the government, the American government will lock you in your own home and force you to close your business, you would have said there is no, no way, way that can exactly. happen in the United States. And here we are in 2020 
and it happened almost overnight. Uh, exactly. So anything can happen. There are no certainties, there are just probabilities. And as, as rational people, we need to understand the world around us, what the global elite, what their objectives are, what their game plan is, and just weigh the probabilities for ourselves and then take action. Right. And that, you know, and that's why I think personally having a plan in place mm -hmm. and then just executing on this plan. I mean, I've been working on this piece for over yeah. 10 years and actually working on the gold piece a lot earlier than that. But I never thought that we, I would see what we're seeing in our lifetime. I just didn't. Yeah, but it gives you the peace of mind because you already got the plan in place and then you don't get emotional about it. Exactly. Right? Like if I you just didn't have execute. A, if, if, that's right. If you didn't have a plan, you'd be freaking out. What do we do? And you'd probably be making bad decisions because you're not thinking clearly. But this is premeditated. All you do is execute. It's like a military operation. Exactly. And you sleep well at night. Yeah, exactly. God, George, I could just keep going on. <laughs> I could keep going on and on and on. But I know that you have something else that you have to get to. And, of course, we're hopefully we have time for a yummy lunch, too. Yeah, yeah. So I'd like to thank everybody for yeah, joining for us watching. today. You know, I hope you got as much out of this discussion as I did. And I'm glad that George is still here in Phoenix. So I get to see him again. And until next time, yeah. you know, just really be safe out there. Bye-bye.